This episode of the Real Rescue Podcast is brought to you by SR3 Rescue Concepts because you don't know what you don't know. Life Saving Systems Corporation, we do our work so you can do yours. Tough gear for tough jobs. Breeze Eastern, the world's only dedicated hoist and winch provider. And Hilo Vodka, simply better vodka. SR3 Rescue Concept is a training company that can help you with your helicopter training, a standardization and safety check, or maybe just an audit or an FAA refresher. They are ready to bring your agency up to date with current techniques, rules, regulations, and equipment. The training staff is amazing! With certified and flight instructor pilots, experienced crew members, which I'm happy to say that I get to be one of them, They offer training in rescue, medical, tactical, firefighting, ground operations, and night vision goggle use. SR3 has partnered with Petzl to assist with the PPE inspection course and the highly specific Lazard, which is used in helicopter cliff and mountain rescues. SR3 goes above and beyond the helicopter world too. They also provide high angle rescue training and tactical medicine training. Contact them today at sr3rescueconcepts.com that's sr3rescueconcepts.com and follow them on instagram at sr3 underscore rescue that's sr3 underscore rescue we're also brought to you by life saving system corporation they manufacture the world's toughest helicopter rescue gear from my favorite harness as a rescueman the triton to the rescue baskets and litters, and of course, the most popular hoist hook in helicopters, the D-Lock. The team at LSC cuts, bends, welds, sews, and machines these products into existence every day and then sends them on their way to us. We do our work so you can do yours. LSC, tough gear for tough jobs. Check them out today at lifesavingsystems.com that's lifesavingsystems.com and follow them on Instagram at R-E-S-Q-G-E-A-R that's at R-E-S-Q-G-E-A-R We're also brought to you by Breeze Eastern Since the very first helicopter rescue in November 1945 Breeze Eastern has designed and manufactured superior rescue hoist solutions While much of the technology and unique mission requirements have changed over the past 75 years, their commitment to the rescuers, the operators, and those who get rescued has not. Contact Breeze Eastern today by visiting them at breeze-eastern.com. That's breeze-eastern.com. And we are brought to you by Hilo Vodka. Hilo Vodka is a premium craft vodka made from the highest quality ingredients and six times distilled. Hilo Vodka was made to be crisp, refreshing, and unintrusive. It's exactly how vodka should be made, clean enough to drink neat and worthy to be mixed with your favorite cocktails. They make a crisp, refreshing vodka that is carefully carbon filtered for a smooth sip and no bite. Hilo Vodka is 100% American made. It is proudly veteran owned by a former search and rescue pilot. Simply better vodka. Order yours today by visiting shophelovodka.com. That's shophelovodka.com. FedEx delivery is available in most states. Use the promo code capitals R-E-S-Q and you get 10% off your order. Plus if you buy three bottles or more, it's free shipping. Please remember to drink responsibly, and FAA Part 91 says eight hours, bottle the throttle. I had a great conversation with our next guest. Uh, He is one of the last guys that we get to hear from with the case when it talks about going to the cruise ship. And he was on the cruise ship itself while I was on the utility vessel, so it was great to hear his side of it. And then in addition to that, he brings another perspective to the table as far as training goes, not just training in rescue and helicopter training, but training medically. And he brings some very valid points to it. So not only do we get to listen to some of his great rescues and stories medically, um, he talks about what he's doing now and the training that he's doing and outside of the helicopter operations. So 
Without further ado, please welcome my friend, Mr. Eben Latchamurdy. My name is Jason Quinn. I am United States Coast Guard Rescue Swimmer number 500. These are my rescues and rescues from those of us that put our lives on the line every day so others may live. This is The Real Rescue Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Real Rescue Podcast. Today, man, my man, Eben Latramurdi. Is that pronounced correctly, by the way? Because I think I screwed it up talking to Eben. Uh, yep, no, Eben Latramurdi. You got it right. Yes. Okay, I talked to Lane and I totally screwed that up. And so when you listen to Lane, yeah, I totally messed that up. So my man, Eben, and he was part of our epic crew, me, Pat, and Eben, and it was, it was awesome. And Eben, welcome to the show. What's up, dude? Awesome. Hey, thanks for having me, man. I'm excited to chat. It's good to see you. I feel like it's been, uh, gosh, it's actually been what, seven, eight years. Uh, yeah, it's, it's been a minute or two for sure. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dude. Well, for everybody else there, please, uh, if you don't mind, introduce yourself, kind of give a little background, a little history about you. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to. Um, well, again, my name is, it's Eben Latramurdy. Um, some people joke it's uh, Ebony and Ivory. It's Ebenezer. It's however you want to say it. Um, yes, Eben Latramurdi. Um, I'm a paramedic. I worked with Jason um, doing some search and rescue stuff. And, uh, you know, I come to you today after I grew up in Colorado, but I spent eight years in the Navy as a shipboard firefighter. Um, after eight years, I realized that I really wasn't ever going to fight fires. And during that time, uh, got into EMS and started doing the EMS path and went to EMT school in Honolulu, uh, got out of the Navy and stayed and worked in Hawaii on the ambulance for uh, a couple of years, four, five, six years, something like that. Um, while I was in Hawaii, I got plugged into aviation, which was always actually my, my ultimate goal when I started in EMS was to be a flight medic. Um, I was graced by just pure luck to kind of know the right people, be in the right place at the right time, and and actually connected with uh, with Alex. I don't know if you've talked to um, Alex Farnsworth yet. I have not yet, but I have her. asked her. She's beautiful, <laughs> and I love that girl. So yeah, you know it uh, it was it was right place, right time, and and she brought me on board when she got um, hired as a kind of a base manager for a fixed wing operation in Honolulu, and she brought me on board literally the same day that I got my paramedic license, which is it's unheard of. You don't get to start flying fixed wing um, critical care inter island transport with, you know, a 24 hour old paramedic license. Um, <laughs> Unless you so, need Devin. What? <laughs> yeah. No, they, they were just desperate. They said, oh, you've got a pulse. Cool. Come help. Uh, I think that's, that's what it was. Uh, so yeah, I got plugged into aviation that way. And actually that's what helped me get um, you know, kind of introduced into more of the helicopter world, which at the time, you know, this was in my, my mid early twenties. And, uh, you know, I wanted to just do the cool license fire and helicopter scene call stuff. And that's, that got plugged into working helicopter search and rescue out there in Hawaii. And, um, I did that for Josh, I did that for maybe seven, eight years. Um, and then uh, moved on to start my own business. And now I uh, actually just run uh, my company, EMS Unlimited. We do all kinds of different stuff and wildfires and special events and ambulances and anything we can that's cool. And uh, you know what? We're going to plug that in right now and say, what's the website for EMS Unlimited? Uh, we are ems-unlimited.com. Nice. ems-unlimited.com. Go check them out. It's uh, it's actually pretty badass, and we're gonna talk about that a little later. But, dude, that that's killer. Now, you and I actually met in your seven years of doing helicopter operations because you were uh, flying in Hawaii for a while, and then the Hawaii gig kind of the contract came to an end, so you ended up coming down to the Gulf of Mexico with us. Um, and you're one of the guys that that helped build that program with us in the Gulf of Mexico from the get go, and. Uh, Man, I, I specifically remember, this is how far back you and I go and how like the very beginning, it's you, me, Bob Watson, and our soon to be or just signed on medical director sitting at dinner talking about how the program was and how we were going to build and get all the equipment and stuff. Do you remember that? 
Um, I think vaguely. I'm trying to remember if that was before or after Haiti. Um, I don't think you went to Haiti. I think that might have been after we went to Haiti. I don't remember who went with me or if anybody did. But um, yeah, I do vaguely remember being with uh, the doctor and in our constant search for good food and barbecue and, and <laughs> Southern home cooking. <laughs> yeah. It, and yeah. actually he was from there. So he's like, Hey, I got a place. Come on. And we were like, Oh, this is amazing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In fact, were you there when, uh, when I buried the rentals in the parking lot? So I came in three days after that happened. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, I had never really been to the south and I, I had to, you know, go from one parking lot to a road and I didn't, there was so much rain that the, the water just looked like it was one flat road. So I, I couldn't see where the exit was and I was going to the road and lo and behold, there was actually a ditch in between that parking lot and that road that was, uh, God, it was probably like five feet deep, I think. The truck was buried up to the middle of the door. <laughs> finally got it out and it wound up sitting in there for gosh the whole rest of my trip with blow dryers on it and i turned it back in i uh, luckily i got the car returned right before it started to smell oh man lucky you got lucky <laughs> yeah yeah i that's oh. one thing I, I won't forget that was hilarious that was hilarious oh god we yeah. had so we had we had a lot of fun so just a whole bunch of stuff um actually another side story is so evan and i you're actually a big motivator to me as to why I went and got my paramedic. And I think I've told you this before, but I'm going to tell you again. So everybody else knows this. We're in the back of the helicopter. And at the time um, I was a very rookie, not rookie. I was a uh, EMT basic, but very low level EMT basic, like hadn't had a lot of patient contact, especially with a paramedic. So we're in the back of the, the helicopter. We had a case, nothing more. We had the patient on board and, uh, and you would ask me to do something. And I'm like, ah, uh, yeah. Uh, and you're like, oh my God, dude. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know what? It, what was great for me is, is it was, uh, there was that moment of like, oh gosh, I, I don't actually know. And we went back and you sat down with me. You're like, dude, let, I got to show you how to put a 12 lead on. Here's where the stickers go. This is what we're talking about with uh, nitro. If you spray this, if you do that, if you, and we're going through bags and the next thing I'm like, oh yeah, I, I need to up my game. I, you know, so fast forward, like you and I had done a couple of hitches and then went away and, and then I was busting my butt to get better in paramedic school. And the next thing I, you and I are stationed together. We do another medevac together. We're coming back and you're like, dude, you, you were so good. You got like EMT of the year. And I'm like, woo, look at me. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I think I, I think I do. I think I do remember that. And I, I think that it was, a, it was a great experience. I think a lot of the guys came from the, the rescue swimmer world. It was a, it was a really good opportunity, I think, to, to work in a, a more, not legit, but a, a good clinical setting. Um, yep. And it was great for me as the paramedic to, to really realize that it's important for me to be a better leader um, as opposed to working in a ground ambulance type of a setting. Yeah. And that's, I mean, you were, you were a big component for me. Uh, I mean, heck you and I were sitting there, you're yelling from your room, Hey, what's this drug? And I'm like, Oh gosh, I forgot. And I'm back in the book studying again. <laughs> yeah. That awesome. uh, that's great though. I mean, look at you, you're, you're a full fledged paramedic, man. You did it. It's, yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah <laughs> so i'll tell you what uh there's actually a couple of cases that, that you and i have but i want to start with you and, and ask you like what are some of the cases that that stand out in your mind in your let me start first right from when you started being a paramedic um into like us doing some hoisting and if we had any anything that stands up and then we're going to go to a cruise ship because you and i were on a, a cruise, cruise ship, ship yes yeah yeah yes well, actually, we weren't on a cruise ship together. But, no, we were not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, it's it's interesting as as we kind of talk and the the memory things start to 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 percolate. Um, you know, so one thing that really stood out to me that is, you know, I think really important. I don't know if you, if you ever met uh, Richard Magyar. Um, no. He was uh, a operator and awesome, awesome, awesome guy that I started working with in Hawaii. He had come from, I mean, he was, he was hoisting out of whatever they hoisted out of when they first put hoist on helicopters in like the seventies and like <laughs> Vietnam. I mean, he, this guy was, he'd been around it all. 
he was amazing. Um, and, and he, he taught me how to operate a hoist. You know, one of the cool things for me was at the time when I started was, uh, you know, the paramedic stuff was not easy, but it was just kind of normal stuff. I wanted to be the cool guy operating the hoist. And he, he started teaching me how to hoist. And at the time it was, uh, we were in the, the Bell 412 and we would go onto the army base and go just find shit to practice on. And there was like an old abandoned World War II Jeep in the middle of nowhere that got blown up during the war. I don't know. And we would just hoist buckets of water into the back of this Jeep and drop it down, pick it up. Um, and I'll never forget the first time that I let too much slack out in the hoist and it got looped around some jagged, rusted edge on this, this Jeep, this rusted out old Jeep. And I felt the helicopter not want to move and, you know, it kind of dipped down. And I literally, I don't know if I can say, I shit my pillow. I shit myself. It was so, it was so <laughs> terrifying. I was like, oh my God, I, I think I saw like headlines flash before my eyes of, you know, butthead paramedic trying to do cool star shit kills, kills a four. That was like <laughs> you know, what I saw. And, and I, and Richard saw the panic in my eyes and he, he heard it in my voice and, and he like just put his hand on my shoulder and he was like, Hey man, it's going to be all right. Let a little slack out, come back and left. And lo and behold, it un untwined. We came up and uh, the cable was fouled. It was no good. I'd gotten a little bit of trouble, but it worked out. Okay. <laughs> oh, uh, snap. <laughs> That, yeah, that's you know a closed the, door talking to right there. Uh, yeah, I mean, come in here and close the door, please. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I think what the, I think why that stands out because it's it's amazing. What I think always impressed me about the the helicopter search and rescue world was those people. Um, you know, Richard Magyar, which you know, like so you probably don't know, but I'm sure there's people who do. And and I know you talked to to Pat Barber already. Is you know, yeah. there's there's so much value in not experience, but in mentorship and passing that along and being um, you know you can have the the greatest book of how to do stuff and jprs or skills signs off but really those those experienced guys are are amazing and i think that's something that's always impressed me about the industry yeah oh i totally agree so well i mean i learned um, everything anyways, from pat barber so i i mean he was yeah. such a big mentor to me uh hoist wise like ridiculous so yeah i yeah, no, Pat's 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 awesome. There's my there's my plug for Pat when he listens. Boom. Um, yeah, Pat, a Pat Barber plug. Um, yeah, no, that story stood out because that was one of the big things that really really got me engaged in um, in the industry because it was uh, you know something that I think was really valuable to me. Totally, that's awesome. Um, yeah. Otherwise, uh, I mean, shoot, I guess I could uh, you know come up with 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 other stories. Um, <laughs> my there were i don't know if you remember the turtle do you remember our turtle from uh from gavelston uh the one that was on the ramp or the yeah our little turtle i i always like get little facebook memories all the time of our little turtle that, that was, nobody wanted to keep oh that's the one that, that was like crawling through the hangar and we're like what the yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. uh who who is the other paramedic with us? Because he's like picking it up. He's like, oh, kiss kiss. <laughs> uh, yeah, I th I think that was Lenny or or Lane. I think would be my guess. Oh my gosh, so funny! I totally remember that. <laughs> we tried keeping him. He didn't yeah. want to stay. <laughs> no, nobody wanted to keep him. Yeah. Oh. Um, no, you know, I I think that I, I'm I'm happy to talk today because I I think one of the biggest things that I took away from working with you and all the other guys is is um you know I. I think at the beginning, and maybe it was just where we worked. You know, I don't know what the rest of the industry was. I think my experience is relatively limited, especially considered all the all the all the badass guys you've been having on the podcast. But I think in in some places there's a, a lack of there's so much focus on the cool shit of hoisting and ropes and carabiners that there's there's less focus on um, you know the the ALS and the the clinical decision making that has to get intertwined to the the search and rescue variables. Right. Right. Okay. I'm, I'm on board with you. I agree. Cause like you said, I mean, you taught me a lot. And when I came into it coming as a basic EMT, just coast guard wise, I didn't have the patience and I was by myself. You know, the, usually the flight mech was not, he might've been CPR. That was about it. So now I'm jumping to the back of Hilo with you and I'm like, ah, uh, so I'm, I'm with you. 
and some of our patients that we had, it was definitely an eye opener for me. So, yeah. 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 It was, it was an interesting intertwine and it was actually, I think a great model of what we did. There was that, you know, pseudo critical care component that was intertwined with the search and rescue component. And it was all very, very dependent on the mission and where you were going and what was going on with the patient. Um, the, the one thing that has always stood out to me actually was, um, you know, side stores, a brand new paramedic where I learned to be a paramedic, we used RSI, um, rapid sequence induction, you know, paralyzing someone to, to take control of their airway because you need to put a breathing tube in. Um, I don't know if you've got people who maybe don't, don't know what that is. Um, anyways, it's, it's a highly invasive, highly dangerous um, skill. And when I went through paramedic school, it was something that we did with, I don't want to say nonchalant, but we did it a lot. And probably a percentage of those times were not 100% clinically indicated. Uh, it was more just uh, an ego thing. Um, I say that speaking <laughs> I, mainly, mainly I like for myself. The honesty. That's, that's pretty good honesty right oh. there. I appreciate that. Oh, absolutely. You know, maybe not ego. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe somebody would listen and say like, oh, this guy's a, this guy's a <laughs> jack off. But, <laughs> uh, but boy, being as, uh, you know, I remember when I was a brand new paramedic, I RSI a guy um, without really doing, you know, my due diligence and making a good clinical decision to say that I should or should not take control of his airway. You know, he was, uh, you know, kind of an overweight, obese guy. Um, he had an awful airway management stuff, you know, his assessments of, you know, how hard it was going to be to intubate him should have flagged me right away. Not to mention the fact I was literally like a quarter mile from the hospital. I could have easily done, um, you know, like a, a load and go kind of a thing. There's, you know, why am I spending 20 minutes on scene messing around with this guy's airway? Oh, um, things you learn. I, I couldn't do it. I learned Well, I learned because I couldn't do it. I paralyzed him and I couldn't get him intubated um, long story short, he went into cardiac arrest because I couldn't get him intubated. Um, luckily, uh, some drugs and a rescue airway, and he came back and he survived, and all was fine. I, you know, was, uh, I, I, I joke when I, I don't joke, but I tell the story of people um, just to say that, you know, I was a, a, a temporary murderer for a lack of a better word. I made a very bad clinical decision. He lost a pulse. Um, and luckily we got him back. But the, the reason I bring that up is there was a case that I did and I, I wish I could remember, I think it might've been with you um, where we had to go to a, a small platform that we couldn't land on. And there was a, a large guy, he was probably your size plus 150 pounds. Um, so he was, you know, big, big guy. That's a big guy. <laughs> I'm six foot four. Yeah. If you're adding another hundred pounds yeah. to me, boy, <laughs> I put yeah. him in the no, 300 he range. <laughs> he was, he was huge. And we had to hoist down and uh, we hoisted down to the deck, went below big guy. He was altered. He was eh, borderline combative. And he, cause he had a head injury, he got bumped in the head with something. I think, I don't remember if he fell or if he got knocked with an I beam. Um, and I remember very vividly thinking, man, I need to take this guy's airway. I'm going to be stuck in a little helicopter with a hoist operator and a rescue swimmer. And he's going to start seizing and throwing up and he's going to, you know, I'm going to be stuck with an airway issue and I've got an hour and a half to the hospital. Um, and I, I vividly remember flashing back to that thought of that guy that, that I had a problem with when I was working on the ground ambulance and I and I took a pause, I looked at him and I said, you know what, this guy's gonna be a really difficult intubation. At the time I had, and in fact, I never did. I never hoisted an intubated patient. I was not looking forward to that idea of one, having right. to extricate this guy from the, the galley, which was two or three decks below the, the top deck roof where we'd have to hoist. Um, he was huge. So it's me and a uh, you know, my partner, plus a, a couple of roughnecks, we're gonna have to carry this guy upstairs, intubated. Um, oh, and by the way, the helicopter is now going to have to go leave to go get fuel. Because if I fuck around here any longer, and yeah. I have to get hoisted up, they're going to run out of time. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And I got to, and I got to figure out how much does the guy weigh, so that I can tell them before they leave how much fuel they can or cannot get, so they can come get me. And then, oh, shit, now we're gonna have to stop to get gas on our way to the hospital. Uh, cause it's, we're so far offshore. Yeah. Um, 
so it was the it was the intermingling of those variables and in addition to what i think is in, is a good point to think of in the the industry is you know those mingle with looking and using the skills of being a good solid foundational paramedic to say you know this guy in addition to all these variables this guy's going to be really hard to intubate and if i paralyze him and i take control of his airway and i don't get his airway I've got no, nobody. I'm so far in the middle of nowhere that if this guy croaks, I'm all by myself. And man, the paperwork is going to suck. So, <laughs> yeah, because I wasn't I, doing the paperwork. Yeah. Oh. Uh, so I, you know, I really, I, I think it's a great thing to point out. And I'm sure a lot of the guys that you work with or the guys that you've already talked to, you know, like Lane and Lenny, I'm sure that they've got, you know, the exact same experiences and the exact same mindset. Yeah. Um, you know, and at the time, I think that it was, um, you know, not something that came into the, the front of mind for a lot of people until we stuck in those situations to say, man, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to do like legit paramedic critical thinking here um, and intertwine that with, with a lot of the helicopter search and rescue stuff. You know, probably I'm really just more of a burden than I am a, a benefit. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, as far as, that's what was nice about working with the the two of us. Uh, and, and I say the two of us, like, you know, rescue specialist and, and you as a paramedic learning again, both of us learn. And I said this with Lane, where I was teaching him a lot of the rescue stuff. He was teaching me a lot of the medic stuff. You know, you knew you could trust me to rig everything the way it needed to be rigged and that you were going to get to the helicopter safely. Um, at the same time, I knew our patient was taken care of because they were in good hands with you. Uh, it's, it's something we do. And if you need a backup, well, man, I, I could use a bag valve. I'm good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, there were so many times where I felt more like a liability than, um, you know, than anything else where it's like, Oh God, I got to make sure Evan doesn't, uh, doesn't cross load that carabiner or, or, you know, rig something wrong. Um, those are, those are interesting things. It was great. It, you know, when I say that we're rescue swim, oh, I'm, I'm here with a rescue swimmer. That's not to say that the rescue swimmer is the, devalued. Um, that's just to say that everybody's got a very specific skill set. And when you're talking about a 300 pound, six foot plus roughneck, that's going to be, you know, an impossible airway where you would be stressing mind out in the middle of a hospital with, you know, respiratory and anesthesiologists, you know, now you're doing that by yourself. That's, right. that's where the, you know, that comes from. Yeah. Do that. I watched you guys do some crazy stuff and let me rephrase that. No, bad. I watched you guys do some incredible work is what I saw. And there were times until I ended up going through all the training that I went through, I did not understand what exactly you guys were, you know, everything that you guys had to do. And once I got there, I'm like, Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. This, this is a big deal. When you're watching the monitor and you're seeing ST elevation, you're like, Oh, and we have an hour to go to get to the helic or to get to the hospital that's a little bit of stress on you because if that dude you know crashes in the aircraft and we got a lot of work and there's not a lot of room so there's one dude on a chest compressions one dude on an airway and you know another guy just holding on to and making radio calls it's it's yeah it gets it gets squirrely yeah i got a helicopter pretty quick <laughs> yeah no it's uh it's it's a it's a great experience i wouldn't trade that experience for for anything i think it made a, a great impact on on my experience and my, my abilities. And it was awesome. Yeah. I, I remember another case. I, well, let me back up to that one real quick again, uh, because I, if I remember correctly and you got, you and I talked a little bit offline, but the head injury guy, um, I think I was with you on that because I specifically remember you and I working together and you were on the radio and we're going towards new Orleans or wherever we're going. And the hospital that we were looking to go to specifically said, we cannot take that patient. We don't have neuro. And you were on the radio and it was the first time I'd ever really heard it. Like the radio call of, are you rejecting this patient? And they came back over the radio and said, yes, we are rejecting the patient. And it was the doctor that got on the radio to say, yes, I cannot take this patient, go to another one. So we get on the radios with the pilots like, hey, we got to find another hospital pretty quick. And the again, whole crew mentality. Pilots like, Roger that, where do you want to go? I got to find somebody for neuro. We get on like uh, some phone to... Life flight phone, whatever it was, the, the bat phone, pick up the bat phone. And they're like, yeah, this is the hospital you need to go to. They're plugging in to make sure we have fuel to get over to that other airport. And then where the fuel stop is from there. Oh my gosh. It was like, 
it was crazy that turned into more crazy that everything worked out. It was, it was pretty good. So. I, yeah, I do. I, I do remember that. I think there was in the area, there was a, uh, like a central line that you could call and they would tell you what, what facilities have the capabilities that you need. Um, and they could, they could direct those facilities. I, I do remember that. And I remember actually it was, it was relatively stressful because it was at the point where we were not too far offshore now. And no. where if we need to turn left, we should have turned left a long time ago. Uh, <laughs> we but, just yeah, added 20 that. minutes to the flight. Uh, it was like, oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the pilots were like, where are we going? Where are we going? I'm like, I don't, I don't know, man. I'm still trying to figure it out. Uh, I do, I do remember that. And I wonder, um, you know, because I think at the time we were, we were going to be flying right over a smaller hospital in like, uh, was it in Homa? I think, I think so, um, where yeah. we would have been dropped them off. Yeah. But then we had to go all the way to new Orleans or, or somewhere nearby that did have uh, a, a could have been Lafayette too. Like it was out of the way. It was not, it would, yeah, it was, it was a pain in the neck. And at the same time it was, it is what it was and, and we made it do so. Kind of, yeah, it, I wonder too if though if that was patient and and again I don't remember who I was with, but I picked up a, a guy who looked like he was he looked exactly like he was having a stroke. I think he even had like a, a, a facial droop. He had slurred speech. He looked like a, a full stroke all the way around. And we took him to one of the smaller hospitals and wound up actually having to then they paralyzed him and intubated him, and then we transferred him to New Orleans. Oh, wow. Yeah, um, I wasn't with you for that one. Um, and I found out later that actually he um, actually had a form. It, it wasn't West Nile, but it was a form of West Nile and an encephalopathy uh, that had actually left him permanently damaged. In fact, up until just a couple of years ago, I still would get updates from his wife on Facebook. What? Um, it, was, it was, yeah, it was pretty, it, it was actually really awesome. It was really interesting. Um, huge. Uh, you know, I know this is the, the rescue podcast, but that was a huge clinical learning experience for me as well. Um, just to see how it, uh, you know, every day of the week, I would have called that a strip and it wasn't, it was, it was really interesting. So it was, it, it turned out to be West Nile. Is that what they, that, that was at the final it diagnosis? No, it wasn't West Nile. It was something very much like West Nile, but it, it <sighs> basically was, it was a, it was a viral thing that caused um, swelling and encephalopathy. And um, yeah, what was really interesting and, and again, no, not rescue at all, but you know, they, they paralyzed and they, they are aside him in the ER. Uh, but because of this viral thing he had going on, they couldn't keep him sedated. No, no matter what they gave him for sedatives, it was, dropping his blood pressure and then they'd titrate it back up and he'd wake up and it was, it was a nightmare and they wound up actually not sedating him and just giving him just a truckload of paralytics, which is, is a, a full on no, no, right. You're paralyzed, but you're basically awake and we couldn't keep him sedated. And then we had to transfer him. It was probably like a 30 minute flight from, you know, some outlier area into actual New Orleans. Um, wow. Yeah. Yeah, it was crazy. Um, definitely not stuff that I was expecting to see. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, whatever, you, you know. know I, go ahead. No, go ahead. Jeff. You go. You, you, tell uh, me, you tell me something that you remember. I, I think that's uh, – my stories are going to be probably, you know, really, really paramedic-focused. and Which is awesome, I know that right? you and I had – a lot of a lot of great great cases so and you did actually i, I was gonna bring up another one well we are so yeah. you and i got out we got called out for a, a dude this was this was wild to me um again trauma like we it was very rare so let me throw this out to everybody when you're when you get launched out from land where we were to go offshore i would say 85 percent of the rigs we went to and that it might be even a high number but they had some sort of paramedic or somebody on the rig that could triage and package. And so we would go show up, get a pass down, you know, here's a patient report. We would do our quick check, boom, load and go. That was normally what it was. We get launched out. This dude, I felt so bad for him. Uh, as a matter of fact, I specifically remember he was from South Africa and he pushed his friend out of the way as something let go off the crane and his back foot got caught 
and like tore half his foot off. And, and yes, sorry, I'm kind of being gross here, but we showed up on scene. Uh, we wrapped his foot. Or I'm sorry, we didn't. They had his foot all wrapped up and whatnot. And then they had wrapped it again because it was still bleeding. Then they wrapped it again because it was still bleeding. And, uh, and we had to fly back, but we couldn't check any motor skills. And we had another flight back. So you're looking at me because I was down by the feet. And you're like, hey, cut, cut a little tip of that bandage off and see if you can feel the toes and see if you can move them and stuff. And, and that's what we're trying to do the whole time. His foot was blue. The first time I had really seen a different pigmented foot. And we had given him something like uh, at least a hundred mics of, of fentanyl to kill whatever pain there was. They gave him like a little bit of morphine or something on the rig. And we we're like, no, 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 let's help this guy out. Wham, hooked him up. But do you remember that one? I, I think I vaguely remember, uh, I, I do vaguely remember, I think I do remember your face turning ghost white when you, you cut those. One, it was like, wait, you want me to do that? It was kind of like, wait a minute, no. I'm I'm here to run the hoist and, and set up carabiners. I don't want to do that. Let's. Why are you asking me? Evan, I'm uh, sorry. Like, okay. No. <laughs> Remember, you gotta I do got, it. I got EMT of the month. Okay, I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I remember it was uh, it was like, well, I don't really want to do that. And you and I could see. I wouldn't say you were shaking, but I definitely remember seeing you like, oh man, this is gonna fucking suck. <laughs> uh, and then and then cutting it off and being like, this is disgusting. Yeah, it, it was. It was uh, rough. Yeah, but it was it. What was interesting yeah. to me no, is like was, there was it was, it was cold to the touch. I still remember this very vividly as well. His his foot that foot was very cold to the touch. He was not getting any circulation. There was really nothing we could do about it. it we just keep the keep a little compression on it so that it's not he's not going to bleed out uh, i also remember getting to the hospital and watching the doctors smoke him with another like 100 or 200 mics of fentanyl and watch that dude go ah oh. and they actually took his foot like yeah. off and and put it back on to realign it i was like oh my good lord <laughs> <laughs> yeah Oh, you and I had some good cases. It was it was fun. So, but what else? Yeah, do you remember? no, anything, uh, anything I think else? you did. It was awesome. Um, you no, know, you know, off the top of my head, I I, I I'm really kind of losing the the fun stories. I think as I'm getting older, they're 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 kind of going away. I don't remember who I was with the first time I got into one of those. What were those things called? Where it's like a a circle platform with the the net that kind of comes up and then that's how they move you oh the billy so the pew. train picks it up the yeah. billy pew yep. yeah um i i remember the first time i hopped into a billy pew and was quite terrified as well <laughs> um I, it might have been with you whoever i was with was just grabbing onto the netting as if it was no big deal and i was like fuck that where do i clip in at this is terrifying <laughs> Was it you and I that went down to that boat? The, the patient was on the ship and the ship was like, kind of like kind of rocking and rolling that day. And we're on the ship. We're like, Whoa. And then we get to the Billy Pew and get picked up. Was that you and I as well? I don't remember. God, there's so many. Of them. I don't know. It, it might've been, I do remember picking up a guy from a boat and I remember having flashbacks to my very first time underway in the Navy. Did you ever, uh, <laughs> did you ever I, have to go on the way? Negative. On a boat? No, sir. Oh. No, sir. Uh, Airedale all the way. <laughs> oh man, it's cheaters for sure. I remember my <laughs> totally off topic. I guess my very first time underway. I remember working for this guy. I was a, a shipboard firefighter. You're a damage controlman. I don't know. Does, the Coast Guard has damage controlman, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. So I was a damage controlman. We were responsible for the the rover watch. So we had the you know somebody had like bilges every day every hour, and I had to follow this guy around. I can't remember his name. Um, he was a total dick. Cause he was like, Oh, let's go have dinner and then go do our, our rove. And I remember it was the shipboard yakisoba. It was like noodles and beef. And I don't know, because we ate and he was like, go eat some more. He's still hungry. He kept making me eat so that he could then take me to the very front of the boat uh, to check a bilge in the sonar dome. And lo and behold, my feet are off the ground. The seas were awful. And I just, I barfed everywhere, everywhere. I'll never forget that just vomit i i mean i've had some wild drinking nights but i've never barfed like that in my entire life <laughs> oh gosh i'm glad you had that flashback and coming off a boat oh That's yeah 
<laughs> yeah, no, it was uh, it was definitely very interesting to do a lot of those hoists onto the back of the boats um, to to have flashbacks to being underway, which sucks. <laughs> um, oh God, that's so yeah. funny. All right, well, I'll tell you what. I am going to move on to uh, our case going into the cruise ship, which is is hilarious to me for for many aspects of it, and part of it is like you guys. Have you know, other people have heard that, you know, we get launched out to the cruise ship carnival, uh, the triumph and they were dead in the water out in the middle of the Gulf. They're getting towed back They're trying or carnival's calling everybody and their brother, please come help us come do something. So we went out to, to bring supplies from the supply ship to the cruise ship. And what I remember specifically about you and I, it was like, well, which one of us is going to go to the cruise ship? And the, <laughs> and I'm not sure if it was you or Gene, or maybe the two of you conspired together, but it was like, you know, we should probably put Evan down on the cruise ship just in case there's medical concerns and we have to bring a patient up. And I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? And I lost. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I do very vividly remember um, the second that question got posed, my gears were smoking with how am I going to get my way here? How am I going to get what I want? <laughs> What, what are my argument points? What is, what am I going to do to make sure I don't get stuck on that little, that little effing dinghy down there and wet and cold and working to where I want to be over there on that big thing. Um, I do remember thinking like, oh yeah, great idea. They've been out, they've been stranded with poor sanitary conditions, not good food and water. There could be a grandma on that boat that has a heart attack. I should be over there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Whatever. Yeah. I, <laughs> I do, I do remember that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, that Whatever was, you said, uh, it worked, Dick. Yeah. <laughs> that was a, a super interesting case. And I, I listened to your, your chat with, with Pat, and I'm sure you said you talked to, to Eugene already. And yep. I'm sure that the, the story is probably well documented. <laughs> um, I, do, I do very well recall making sure that, one, I remember how excited I was. It was... Yeah. It was really, I think that, you know, it was, it was a, one of those really cool, cool things that gives you a good sense of purpose. You know, you're like, wow, I'm really legit doing something that is not to say that taking care of all these other patients that we take care of isn't, isn't meaningful and purposeful, but it's, you know, it's, it's a, it's a large scale thing that is really on a, on a big time impact for, for all those people who were, you know, without food and water and i don't even think they had running water at the time I don't nope. think they had toilets anymore at, yeah, at that point yeah they had nothing yeah. um and what they were they were off the coast of mexico somewhere when they had a, a a fire in an engine room and basically had to lose all they had to shut down all engines all generators and all that was that right that's right yeah and then next thing you know they're in tow and, and i'm putting down on the supply vessel and you're going to the cruise ship <laughs> yeah so, yeah and um yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. No, well, I was gonna say. So when I got down to the the vessel, so we did this for two days, which was which is a blast. And um, like you said, one of the cool things that I actually really enjoyed about that in particular case, and uh, is the fact that it was a unique case, and like that was not something we saw every day. We we did see patients, and like I, I, we treated every patient exactly the same, transported with care, got them to the hospital, you know, did everything we needed to do. This in particular case was just like, wow, this is this is unique and different. And uh, man, I, I remember like after day one and you're like, you're coming up to me. You said, well, I got a drink with an umbrella in it. And, and I know you didn't. At least I don't think you did. <laughs> no, no. For, for the record, I never actually consumed a beverage with an umbrella drink with an umbrella in it. I never, <laughs> I never had a drink. I actually, I didn't drink alcohol at all. There was no, no it didn't have to be alcohol, anything. It could have been like a watermelon <laughs> drink with an umbrella. It was something with a damn umbrella. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, no, no, there was no umbrella <laughs> drink, but I did. I, I, I am the very first to admit that I had the, the super cush deal um, about that. Yeah. I wish that uh, I wish I used to have a I had the video that you made um, at one point st stored in my my Google Drive or something and I remember watching it a couple of years ago just laughing my ass off from Pat's camera where you could see the you know the funny part of the the yogurts and the melons but where you could actually see 
just how I'm really just standing there doing jack shit. I'm <laughs> standing there with, and then you know, there's there's a wall behind where there was, I think, like a dozen little ship workers who yeah. were just waiting for me to just give them the nod, and then they would come and do all the work. <laughs> all I was doing was just uncooking and hooking. Um, <laughs> that was great. <laughs> well, meanwhile, I'm on the supply boat, getting absolutely drenched. Water's coming over, like everything, and. I, I, yeah, I, I think I needed new boots. I needed a new flight suit. I had like diesel fuel all over me because it was like falling out of the generator. And I'm like, oh my God. And you're like, yeah, I got my umbrella, umbrella drink. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think that, I think after the first day, there was some discussion about whether we should stop for the second day. Yeah, there whether was. We should say, oh, maybe, maybe Jason should go to the cruise ship and Abbott should go to the thing, to, to, the, to the supply boat. And again, I was like, nope. <laughs> no, I think I'm pretty sure it was pretty dire over there. In fact, I had a couple of people come up to me and ask me some pretty, pretty complex paramedic questions. Uh, so I don't think, I don't think Jason could work over there. Uh, Cause I was like, no uh, way. I, I'm not going, I'm not going to, to do like actual work. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate the honesty. Well, all right. So that's yeah. why I had to rig the basket the way I did. You know? All right. So now let me tell you actually what happened. So I, you know, it, I could say I rigged it. You know, to set it up like that on total purpose. Yeah, it was not on totally purpose. So I, we have like this box, like three or four boxes of yogurts. And one of the boxes had been like hit by the wave. They had come onto the boat. And it, the bottom of the box is kind of like tumbled as I'm dumping it in. I'm like, it'll be all right. I just dumped the rest of them in the, in the basket. Well, when Pat hoisted it up, there were like three or four that came bombing down. I'm like, whoa, whoa. And then I'm thinking about you. And I'm like, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh, it was great. So. Yeah. I, um, in fact, I, I, uh, I, I just sent you, I sent you that uh, the picture. I still have the the purple carnival towel that was given to me when i was on the deck watching the basket come down looking up and then all of a sudden it was uh and it was like the battle of the bulge it was just raining fire on me of yogurt <laughs> just all over the place it hit me in the head it went everywhere i think i slipped onto the yogurt and fell i don't even know it was a disaster so the the cruise ship guys were like hey here's a towel, at least wipe the yogurt off your, your helmet and your visor. Um, and so I still have that, that towel, and which is, which is awesome. It's a purple carnival towel. I'm, I'll, I'll probably get cremated with that towel when I die. I love it. I love it, man. It. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, what's, what's, what's interesting though, that actually reminds me of, a, you know, I think you could call it search and rescue is it actually was a, a co-op mission that I did with the coast guard when I was in the Navy, we were off, off the shore of, um, I think it's a Marine base. Is it Moorhead? Is there a Marine base near Moorhead in like Carolina, one of the Carolinas? I think so. Yeah. I'm Maybe. Gonna say, yeah. Um, yeah. I remember we sailed up there and we were on our way back and there was this like refurbished old pirate ship that was taking on water, uh, you know, from back in the days where they would make boats with, you know, just the planks and they would, they would stuff, they would seal the, the gaps between the wood with, um that fiber like almost like a hemp rope fiber and that's that's how you um seal up the wooden ships anyways they were taking on water and the reason why i think the two stories are connected in my brain we took small little rib boats over there and we brought all of our dewatering pumps and we were i at the time was legit working i was actually was like 20 years old and i remember just busting my ass running pumps and hoses and trying to dewater them because they were they were listing and it was an awkward situation because there was, it was like a youth core thing of a bunch of hippies. And there was literally people standing in the bilges with us taking bong rips and trying to pass them to us. They were like, here, you want to hit up my joint? And we're all standing there like, are you kidding me? Um, and the reason why I think I, rem I think of that it's because on the cruise ship, there was people who were like, here, come inside. Let me, we, we don't have any real good food, but here, do you want some caviar? Do you want some champagne? Like they had actual legit, um, like <laughs> alcohol and fancy food that they were saving for certain people. And they were offering it to me and saying, Hey, do you, you know, you want a drink? Do you want to, we'll go make you a margarita. And I was like, well, 
probably shut ends. I, I have a gut feeling they'll sniff it out on me if I, <laughs> if I do that when I get to the helicopter. <laughs> oh my gosh. Dude, that's hilarious. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, no, it was, it was awesome. And you know, what's, uh, what's cool is a lot of that stuff that we learned, I've, um, I mean, I've applied it even today in a lot of what we're doing with, um, with our, our wildfire stuff. So it's, I mean, I, I love my experiences. I love working with you and all the guys. Yeah. Um, and it's, I gotcha. it's awesome. I think this pot, I, I think this podcast you're doing is awesome too. I think it's oh, great to, to just chat and hear stories. And I, I probably don't have anything really valuable to offer in the rescue world, but I think well, it's great that you're, you're actually, uh, you do. And, and I want to actually touch on that a little bit more right now is because what I'd like to talk about is there, there are other agencies around the world, um, with the guys that I talk to, they're paramedics, critical care paramedics. They're uh, and they're the guys that are on the back of the ambulance, or I'm sorry, at the back of the helicopter doing their stuff. So, for your take on what we did, like, what would your suggestion or training or, or anything uh, be in relation to the advanced care? Like, what would you tell somebody to go do? I know you were an FPC, uh, which is sorry, flight certified paramedic. You know, worked with a lot of flight nurses. You know. Um, you're like, what would I, what would I offer or recommend or suggest? Yeah. Uh, I, mean, you know, I don't know. It's, I think that was, little, it's a little vague. I'm sorry. I, I don't want to get too specific not, on it, but you know, like it just no, basically, it, go, it, go ahead. It is. It's, it's really hard. I think it was a really, really steep learning curve for me coming from this, like, you know, I'm a badass paramedic. I need a whole ambulance full of cool shit to be awesome. Um, and I think one of the biggest things that I learned was to be able to, to provide the best patient care possible with minimal amounts of equipment and to have to multi-purpose things. Um, because obviously, I mean, you can't, you can't stuff all the cool paramedic critical care shit that you want in a helicopter that also now has to carry um, you know, carabiners and pickoff straps and all this yeah. stuff that is related to the search and rescue mission. And I think the intertwining of the two is, is I think it's a steep learning curve. And you know, I don't know what other agencies are doing, only where we worked. Um, I think that as a, as a whole, I mean, I think it would be really great where there's, there's a paramedic, you know, there's the flight paramedic certification, there's a critical care transport certification, there's all these certifications, but, um, you know, it'd be cool if there was something that was really more focused on the the search and rescue paramedic, both both wilderness backcountry, you know, mountain based wilderness paramedics. Um, not not to say wilderness because wilderness is different, but really intertwining the variables that are um, specific to search and rescue, where there's so many different things to consider in like the ground based search and rescue and helicopter search and rescue, which is a, a whole nother animal. Um, and again, the, the differences between the aircraft that we were in versus, um, you know, the 412 that I started in where there's way different room. Your patient management is different. Your mission profile is so different. You know, people say helicopter EMS and they think nurse paramedic and ventilators and just all this crazy critical care stuff when that's, that's not your mission profile. Your mission profile is to be able to adapt to the the search, the rescue, the mass casualty, all that stuff doesn't fall into your normal medevac, you know, one patient A star hospital to hospital scene flight mission. Um, right. And the, the, the training, I think, is probably, yeah, I think we did, I, I felt very well prepared in my training um, from the search and rescue perspective. I felt, um, you know, the repetitions were great. I felt like, you know, even being a hoist operator, I think that the, the ability to be a hoist operator, um, the rescue specialist, I, I never had any desire to get in the water like you do, but, uh, <laughs> it's okay. I got you back. Uh, yeah. Uh, how I, I don't think that there was good. I, I don't, I can't even say good. There was zero clinical training or zero clinical, um, consideration for the the intermingling of the search and rescue and, and that case that I mentioned at the very beginning where you've got the head injury patient you've got limited scene time you've got challenging extrications you've got challenging airways you've got long transport you've got long response time long transports um, fuel challenges and, and all these things 
I don't really feel like I was ever prepared for. I think that that's something that, you know, maybe other agencies are doing it. Maybe it's doing now. Cause that was a long time ago. That was almost 10 years ago yeah. that that happened. So um, I would hope that as an industry, that there's, there's good focus now on it, bringing the, the, the expertise in the search and rescue and, and taking that to the clinical side to make sure that we're, we're using good decision-making that's, that's, taking into account the, the stuff that happens from, again, the search and rescue side, the, and just the aviation side as well. Right. No, oh, I, I think that's great. One of the things that we had talked about while we were down there was uh, even how, how could we utilize our medical uh, directors and work like maybe a shift or two in the ER to keep up with skills and stuff. And, and like, I look back on that, that is actually something I'd, I'd like now. And, and, you know, I talked with, you know, my buddy Lenny and you know, he had just done a hospital stent while he was home. And that was, he was like, man, it was great to start getting patient contact again. It is a perishable skill. You do lose that. And I, there's no question about, yeah, you just yeah, have to have patient contact. You know, it doesn't mean you're not going to do a good job, but there's yeah. that, you know, if you're not on a hoist hook or, or if you're not training on that side for six months, a year, well then, you're going to suffer on that side as well. And patient contact is important. That is why we're going out to help somebody. They're in trouble. So yeah, really- yeah there's, there's so much emphasis on, I, I mean, it's, it's legitimately so there's so much emphasis on train, 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 and just be badass with, with carabiners and ropes and hoist um, because that shit will kill you. And that's, I don't, I don't want to die, but there's less emphasis on, um, you know, again, the, the components of taking care of the patients and maintaining perishable skills. Um, and that's where, you know, finding that balance between your, your normal flight for life style model, your normal, um, you know, mainland, if you will, type of a medevac situation, uh, as opposed to the search and rescue model and finding that, you know, one, ex- the one extreme is the, 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 the mainland medevac flight for life model and the other extreme is is kind of that coast guard model where it's a rescue swimmer that is badass with rescue stuff and plugging holes and then finding where those two come together uh i think is is that was my my drive and my mission of what i wanted to try and do and i i don't think that ever uh, never mind but that's uh (laughs) <laughs> I think that um, I think that's an important. I hope that's a, I hope that's the direction that the industry is going. Uh, I mean, I think it's important. It, like you know, you one of the things that I like I said. I mean, you were a big component to me graduating paramedic school. We practiced stuff all the time. We went over drugs. We went over uh, what would you do for this. And as a matter of fact, I still remember to this day. We're in Port Fouchon. We're staying on duty, and I had just gotten done with uh, a bunch of either my clinicals or I had just gotten done with something and you ran me through my, uh, my mega code again. And I had just finished it like the week before you're like, yeah, I don't care. Let's go again. And I was like, Holy cow. I nailed it. I, I will say I nailed it. I don't care if you remember or not. <laughs> I nailed it. <laughs> but that was, you know what? It was, it was good for me because you have to keep training. It's we didn't stop practicing hoist or or anything like that in helicopter ops. Why would we stop training in medical? It, it's a it's a smart move. So everybody out there that's doing it, make sure you get your good medical training as well as all your rescue training. Super smart. Yeah, cool. yeah, it's awesome. And, and you know, I'll put a little plug in there. I even see the same thing. Um, you know, so EMS Unlimited, we do. We just started this year, uh, we built a land-based search and rescue, a private search and rescue team that does um, wildfires. So we've fabricated a, a ranger, a Polaris ranger, um, so that it can transport patients. And we've qualified a bunch of people in high angle, low angle rope rescue and all this stuff. And, and there's, it, it, there's, even within our organization, there's this battle between, not a battle, but you know, the guys who are all into the ropes and, you know, the, all this rescue stuff are like, no, Evan, we need to make more room for more ropes and more carabiners. And I'm like, no, we need to have a, a life pack and we need to have an IO and we need to have these drugs. And we, no, I want this bag full of this med gear. And we're back and forth with, you know, cause we've, it's, it's a very similar model of, we have a Polaris Ranger, which is like, 
you know, that's like a, that, it's, it's like trying to run a helicopter search and rescue out of a, a fucking MD 500. So um, <laughs> that's our equivalent. And um, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting to see how a lot of our guys are very like ropes, 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 pulleys and mechanical advantage. And, and I'm like, no, man, we got to be able to, to do something once we're there and not just plug holes and pick them off a cliff. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting to see how that transpires even within our organization. Yeah. You know what? Work on a weakness. Uh, if your weakness yeah. is medical, I mean, get in the books. <laughs> if your weakness is ropes, yeah, get on some uh, ropes. Work on that weakness. It's awesome. Yeah. We've, we've got a, a great, great crew and it's, it's awesome to see how that develops. And it's, it's cool actually to see the parallel um, again, I'm trying to, to basically be a helicopter search and rescue out of a Polaris Ranger, which, like I said, is the equivalent of a little you know, mosquito helicopter um, to be able to accomplish a mission that is almost identical with the exception of rather than hoisting, you know, we're having to drive in awkward places and in UTVs and set up the same types of systems. So how many guys have you got per Polaris or crew? What, what is it called? I've heard it called like a REM, um, REMS, rapid. Yep. So the rapid extraction module. Um, so what we do, we have, we send out, you know, firefighter qualified EMTs and paramedics out on ambulances, which is you know, relatively less exciting. That's, you know, kind of parked off a line, less in a dangerous area, patient transport. Um, we also have what's called a line medic, and that's someone who's really up in the hills with the hand crews who are digging line, and, and you're there as that, you know, kind of first response um, on scene kind of a person. And then the, the, the last part of that is called the, the REM unit or the rapid extraction module. And that's, um, there's a lot of different variables. And, and you know, what, what's interesting is, is on the parallel in the, the helicopter search and rescue industry, I think that the the oversight and the rules and the regulations were really aviation focused, but not so much clinical focused. And, and a lot of times, once you went offshore, there really were no rules. It was, it was relatively wild, wild west in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, and, and we have kind of the same thing. There's not a whole ton of regulations and rules and even standardization in the, the REM unit where the REM unit is designed to access patients in remote areas that you know otherwise can't be can't be reached and there's a lot of different different models and different setups and different configurations because there is no real true standardizing regulatory body that says this is what a REM team is I mean there is and there's a lot of guidance but there's thing that says you this is what you have to do yeah um, which is Except for California. California makes rules for everything. Um, <laughs> <laughs> of course they do. It's California. Of course they do. <laughs> um, so yeah, we, we send it out as a four-person team. It's two, two EMTs who are low-angle rescue qualified, uh, another EMT who's high-angle, and a paramedic who's high-angle. Essentially, it's one paramedic, three EMTs. Two of those people have to be low-angle um operators and two of those people have to be high angle technicians um so and, and like i said they were using right now the the ranger with the fabrication so basically three of the guys have to sit up front so one poor guy's got to sit in the middle and then the medic sits in the back and is able to to do patient care <clears throat> that's that's pretty awesome i like that a lot yeah, it's uh, it's sweet. It's been a huge investment, uh, but we're excited. We've got uh, we've got our our REMS team is deployed right now. They're in uh, Arizona, not too far from Phoenix. As a matter of fact, one funny story. I got a text when they were on their way to Arizona, uh, saying that the roof of the Ranger has departed the Ranger. <laughs> so the <laughs> the 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 ranger's got you know the, a plastic roof uh so that the patient doesn't get rained on or sun in his eyes and the crew gets shaped it, it's um it's awesome but essentially they were driving and it was windy and a gust of wind came inside the ranger on the trailer and ripped it right off um so that sucked uh i had to do an, <laughs> a, a rush 
by the way, it's not like a require. You're not required to have a roof on your UTV. It's just kind of sucks for the crew to now be just going through gallons of sunscreen uh, while yeah. they're on the fire with the roof over the head. Anyway, so I got this text that hey, the, the roof has departed the, the ranger. We don't know when or where, but they had a car pull up next to them and start, you know, honking and doing this like, hey, you're, you lost your roof way back there, I guess. Um, so the, but with the tie into that is I started racking my brain with like, well, what the shit am I going to do? Because when you go out on a wildfire, they set up the incident command at who knows where. This one happens to be set up at a high school, but there's it's a small city that, that runs these these wildfire incidents so it's not like i can just ship a roof to the command post at the high school because it's going to show up and there's you know five million assholes there and it's odds of getting lost are high that's a, a thousand that's a thousand dollar roof so um, i racked my brain i reached out actually to mike smith i don't know if oh you yeah mike. come on mike yeah. oh, that's awesome <laughs> uh, so, so actually, I, I over, I didn't, I shipped the, I ordered online the uh, the roof replacement, had it shipped to Mike's house, and they are actually probably right this minute at, or later tonight at Mike's house picking up the roof. Oh, that's uh, um, awesome. He's not too far from there. It's always good to have good connections and everywhere you go. I love it. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's really cool. It's uh, it's it's fun to be able to take, and that that kind of goes back to the the mentorship and the Richard Magyars and the Pat Barbers, but the the camaraderie and and I love the whole industry where it's 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 big but it's small and it's tight knit and everybody kind of knows everybody and um you know, even though I haven't worked with Mike in yeah probably what 2013 14 so, yeah. you know it's been eight years uh I mean I kind of come out of the blue and I was like hey. I'm not going to bother you with formalities. I don't give a shit how you're doing. Do a favor. Uh, and he, was, he was like, yeah, what do you need? Yeah, that's all. And that's a good friend right there. I mean, I, you know, I do it for you. I think you would do it for me. If I need something in Colorado, I'd be like, you know, Evan, uh, I need a favor. Yeah. I mean, if I had, if I, if, if Lenny or Lane or any of those guys were, in Colorado on a ski trip with a flat tire. They didn't even bother to call me to tell me they're here. And they called and said, Hey, I don't really know what the fuck you're doing, but I'm here and I have a flat tire. And I think you live in Colorado. Can you come help me? And I'd be like, yeah, sure. I'll well, be right there. I'm on my way. And then you're going to buy me yeah. a beer for not calling me when you're in town. <laughs> uh, yeah. In fact, I think Troy comes to Colorado like once a year and he never even, uh, never even says like, Hey, I'm coming to Colorado. What are you doing? Come on, Troy. Call come on, me. Troy. Get with the, get with the program. <laughs> Man, that's awesome. All right. So one more question about your uh, EMS Unlimited. So being that you're deployed uh, all over, you, got, you, you said you got guys down in Arizona right now. Um, how, how does somebody get in touch with you? How do we, how do we like link up for multiple um, things? You know, one, you, are you hiring anybody? Yeah. Cause that's, that's always, if you're looking for medics, we, you know, this is a great spot to start. And if there are people in needs and service, how do they get in touch with you? No, oh, great question. Well, the easiest way is just straight through our website, the emsunlimited.com. Um, they can, you can apply for a job there or, you know, book us out for, we'll, we'll do just about anything um, that's, that's paying. So uh, yeah, the, the wildfire awesome. stuff is great. The, the special events are great. In fact, we've got the really cool special event that we're doing. We're doing um, a, uh, a cycling relay ride from like west coast to east coast and so we'll have like six to ten paramedics who are basically getting paid to sit in an escort shuttle and travel across the country um so that's that'll be an awesome opportunity and and yeah the the, the fire deployments we've got all of our medics right now in arizona and i've in the last two days turned down multiple deployments because we're all out of staff we've got everything deployed we're all out of resources man well, it sounds yeah. like you, I, I, I can't help you out. I'm on the wrong side of the world, but <laughs> next time. <laughs> anyway, I'll call you when I get back into the States. All right. <laughs> yeah, that would be awesome. I think you'd, uh, you should, you should come do some of some fun shit with us. Uh, yeah. Sounds like a good time. I'd be all right with that. I, do I get to drive? Awesome. That could be question number one. Uh, do, you get to drive the, the, do you get to drive the Ranger? Uh huh. Uh, well, you got to pass a class. <laughs> so your moment um, of silence is enough. I'm good. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I know we're, we're kind of coming up on time, but I, I don't think you were ever around. I don't know if I ever told you this very funny story that reminds me of your 
you know, you want to drive the Ranger. That's equivalent to when I first started flying. Um, there was a really fun pilot that I worked with, um, Chad and Chad and Drew. They were great, great pilots, but I always gave them a ration of shit. I was like, you guys have the easiest job. All you do is sit here and move a bunch of, you're playing a video game. And I'm back here doing legit paramedic shit. And uh, Chad got sick of it. He said, fine. You think you're so badass? You think my job's so easy? You come sit up here uh, on the helipad. He was like, cool, just get us off the ground. It's not that hard, right? And um, I did. I got one skid off the ground and we started to wobble bobble and again another time early in my career where i probably literally shit myself um and chad's over there just laughing as he's saving our lives um as i've just about crashed the helicopter and like done a rollover on the helipad um so that will transition to say no you can't drive the ranger until you're signed off that's Roger that. that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay with it. Dude, Evan, thank you so much for coming on, dude. Uh, I, it, it's been an ultimate pleasure. It's great to see you again, my friends. So Awesome. Anyway. Well, cool, man. I, I appreciate you having me, and um, hopefully we'll, you'll keep going, man. Good job. Thanks, dude. I appreciate everything. Awesome. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we are out of here. Thank you for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Real Rescue Podcast. Please take a minute and like my daughters like to tell me, like and subscribe. Oh yeah. I'm pulling chocks and taking off. But before I go, if anyone out there has a rescue story that they would be willing to share, I would be humbled and honored to have you as a guest. Or if you have any questions about any of the rescues or anything else that we talk about here on this podcast, send me an email, therealrescue at gmail.com. That's T-H-E-R-E-A-L-R-E-S-Q at gmail.com. You can also check us out on our Facebook and Instagram page at The Real Rescue. That's at T-H-E-R-E-A-L-R-E-S-Q. I also want to give a special thank you to all of you standing on the watch today. Always remember that when that SAR alarm goes off, those in distress are praying for a miracle. They are going to get you. Until next time, fly safe and swim hard.